especially the second chapter with that wonderful hymn about the self-emptying of Christ and the exaltation then as well. And uh, now we're going to talk uh, uh, from our passage from the third uh, chapter of Philippians this morning. And in that chapter, Paul is talking about uh, our salvation or our deliverance and our redemption, which really means our freedom um, is what those words mean. Um, and he talks about this very much as being a process, a process over time that we are all engaged in. And so he talks about, in the beginning of chapter 3, which we didn't read, about gaining Christ and participating in God's righteousness, which is really the word justification. It's not about a legal transaction. It's about our participating in the wholeness, righteousness, the life of God. And so participating in the good through faith uh, in Christ. And this is how he describes it. He says, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And we've heard this kind of process language already as we've looked at these books of Paul. Uh, in Galatians, he says, uh, through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. In other words, something that is not quite experienced in all its fullness yet, but nevertheless, we wait for and we are on the road toward and we are experiencing now um, to some degree. And so he says, it goes on in uh, our passage this morning, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward or forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize, and what is the prize? Is it acceptance? Is it finally God's love and forgiveness and grace uh, afforded to us? That's not how he describes it. The prize is simply this heavenly or upward call of God in Jesus Christ. So again, talking about the process uh, here. It's a process, or way, the language we use so often here is it's a journey. It's a journey that we're all on because it's a journey of life. Uh, we are not, uh, what is the saying, not human beings on a spiritual journey. We are spiritual beings on a human journey. <laughs> it's part of living, in fact, is being part uh, of this process and this journey. Um, you know, I grew up in the South, and uh, I heard more than one sermon, um, quite a few through the years, that that would claim that if you did not know the time and the hour and the day that you were saved, then you are not saved. <laughs> it happens like that. You know, coming down the aisle, you know, giving your life to Jesus. It's a thing that happens all of a sudden. And when you have a transactional view of that deliverance and that freedom as being something that is purchased or something that is part of a transaction with God, then that's the way you think about it. But that's not how Paul thinks about it. Paul talks about it, again, as being this process. And so rather than a transactional view of this journey that we're on, or just transactional view in terms of our relation with God and our experience of God, um, <clears throat> Paul offers instead a transformational view of that, a transformation over time that is changing us and through us changing our world as well. <laughs> He says it so well in the next book that we'll be uh, starting to preach about or preach from, that's 2 Corinthians, where it says that we are being transformed into the image of Christ from one degree of glory 
to another. And so Paul takes very seriously this process and that God is active in our lives, that this transcendent reality that in fact is part of who we are is drawing us into a deeper experience of God, which is also a deeper experience of ourselves. And so also in Philippians he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you enabling you to both will and work for God's good pleasure. And last week I introduced the idea of two movements in this process, a movement of ascending and a movement of descending as well. And so we talked about ascension or the, the path of ascension last uh, Sunday um, as described in this wonderful hymn um, that is not so much a metaphysical text about uh, Christ, as it is an invitation into the experience of Christ, and so into the self-emptying and giving ourselves in obedience, even unto death, and then also the exaltation, the arising, the ascending uh, into the life of God. The ascending path is about death and resurrection, and so he says it here in uh, this part of Philippians, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings but by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And so this is about dying to the old self in order to be born anew and raised in the life of God. And I've said this many times, it does no good for us to believe in cross and resurrection if we have not experienced cross and resurrection, the ascending in to the life of God, to loose the feathers of earth in order to ascend into the heavens, to ascend to the good, and there to encounter the very source of our being and our existence. But there's a problem with the ascending path um, when we take it as the only path uh, on the spiritual journey, because what that can lead us to is a sense of escaping from this world, or even worse, to uh, disdain our life and experience in the material world and to seek only the heavenly realms, only an experience of God, and so to deny uh, our bodily existence and our existence in this world, there's a lot of spiritual paths that uh, make that error, I believe. And the Christian version of that, by the way, is this idea that the world is all evil and bad, and one day we will get to escape it into a heavenly, some other heavenly realm in the sweet by and by. That's an escape. That's an ascending and a, a vision of ascending that misses the other part of our spiritual journey, and that is the descent. And that's why the descent is so important to us. The descent is about embracing our earthly bodily, bodily existence as itself being a manifestation of God, a manifestation of the divine life, that this world is imbued with the presence and the life and the love of God, in fact. Now, I was with a uh, group of Presbyterian elders this week, I won't say who they were, <laughs> but we were talking about the church, not, not from this church, um, but we were talking about the church and they were kind of despairing and they started talking about the world and how bad it is and how it's worse now than it's ever been before. <laughs> and that's their view of the world. And, uh, you know, I, I had to say, well, actually, I think it's maybe better than it ever was <laughs> in the world. We still have problems, certainly. But we've overcome a lot of things, too. And the point is, we are moving forward. And our Christian hope doesn't just give us hope for eternal by and by. Our Christian hope gives us hope for, for the world that we live in, that this can actually change and be transformed. And we can move forward uh, in ways that are redeeming, that is, setting free, in ways that are releasing, saving us from the things that are holding us bondage and keeping us down. God is not only to be found in the heavens, but in the multitude of forms and experiences right here in our mundane, daily, ordinary lives, that that is also the presence of God right there. Now this is why I think where I think Paul, he's not so explicit about this, he says a lot about ascending uh, into the heavens and you know all this kind of ascending kind of language in this letter. But here's where Paul is expressing the descending path. 
For one thing, he, write, he is writing from prison. And he doesn't know if he's going to be executed or not. In fact, there's a good chance that he might. And in the face of all that, nevertheless, this letter is full of joy and rejoicing and gratitude to God. And uh, he says, you know, and it's not just... It's, it's not for him just a, an attempt to escape. Um, he is fully engaged uh, in his world and in his ministry and in his life. He says, uh, for to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. I do not know which I prefer. Uh, they're both the same. But really where we see it most clearly is in his love for the Philippians. It's such an affectionate letter. And we see one very personal expression of this in the letter to the Philippians. He talks about his friend Epaphroditus. He describes him as uh, the Philippians' messenger and their minister to his need while he was in prison. And he says Epaphroditus became very distressed because they had heard in, in Philippi that he was sick, he had been ill, and he had almost died. And Paul says, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, so that I would not have one sorrow after another. Paul is fully engaged, fully immersed, fully embracing of his life and his ministry and in the life and ministry of others. Even though that life presents him with suffering and with sorrows and even with death. And it's not because Paul was some kind of superior moral person. <laughs> That's not the point at all. But he has known the embrace of God in those heavenlies and he has also known God's embrace of all the earthly. He has touched something more real at the core of his being than anything else that this world has to offer. And out of that, he embraces the world in presence and spirit and love of God. And so his joy is born in freedom, freedom that comes from knowing our true source and pursuing our highest goal. Paul has ascended through death and resurrection, that he might ascend, is con and continues to ascend through death and resurrection, that he might also descend into the embrace of God in the world. And I think it's so well expressed in his closing remarks to the Philippians. He says, I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being well-fed, and of going hungry, of having plenty, and being in need. I can do all things to the one who strengthens me. You know, I'm constantly surprised uh, on this spiritual journey. I confess to you that I really do not know what God is up to. <laughs> there is so much that is lost, and so much to be gained. It seems sometimes that every goal that I've ever set for my spiritual life, um, I have miserably failed to achieve. <laughs> and yes, I've had experiences of the divine life and presence, sometimes accompanying my t uh, feeble attempts at spiritual practice, uh, but more often they have been unexpected or even uninvited. Intu intuition taking form in the most unlikely of contexts. I suppose I have learned, if nothing else, <clears throat> to pay attention. Whenever I have ascended to some dizzy heights of spiritual sensitivity, I soon find myself cast down again into the demands and stresses of mundane life. I used to think that a failure, but now I see it all as part of the process of rising and return, ascent, and descent. I find that it is perfecting me, but strangely within my many imperfections. Calling me forward, though, even when the road is rough and I seem to have lost my way. I must seem a mess to some, but a godly mess, at least. Not because I have made Christ my own, but because Christ has made me his own. Not so much that I have ascended, been successful in ascending to God, but because God has descended to me. Incarnation of spirit, yes, in Christ, but also in you, 
and in me and in all creation. And so I press on toward the goal. The heavenly upward call of God, yes, but also the downward earthly call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.